Welcome to Devotion Time. Today, I would like for us to look at the Old Testament for some scripture to talk about. It's taken from the book of Judges, which is not a book you very often hear read or preached from the pulpit. But it has some interesting things, I think, to say to us this day. This is the story of Deborah, who was one of the early Old Testament judges. So listen now, if you will, from the book of Judges to the fourth chapter. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had, King Jabin, had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. This is the word of the Lord. We give thanks. I want to talk about judges in the Old Testament. I want to talk a little about um, a little about Deborah. She is one of uh, one of the most influential judges and women, indeed, talked about in the in the Old Testament. But it's important that you understand what an Old Testament judge was like, not so much like the concept that we, that we have in our judicial process today of hearing this case and then seeking facts and ruling on it and, and heavily involved with the law. Uh, Deborah's and the judges um, were there to um, sift through and um, and sort out uh, what was brought to them, and the the people that would come to them were seeking. <clears throat> they were seeking discernment. What is it that I should do under these circumstances, Deborah? And so, as I as I said, she sat under the palm tree, and when she was sitting there, people would know you can come to Deborah and present this issue that you have, and she will help you um, by looking to God's word and helping you find your way. Now, if you think about the Old Testament setting, and indeed much of the New Testament setting, you, you will remember that the position of women um, was not overly elevated, shall we say. Um, and yet Deborah is, was a respected woman whose thought process and decision making was valued by all. She, um, she did more than that. She, um, she um, preached and she led worship um, and she shared God's word to her, which was very brave and she has a reputation for being an extremely courageous woman. It, she had to be. As I said, given the setting of the Old Testament and the fact that God called her to speak God's word to the people and she was courageous enough to say, whatever it is that you speak to me, that is what I will speak to the people. So she sits and folks come to her and they present a problem. And so Deborah sifts through everything that she is hearing and she and she prays and she listens to God and then she sort of mediates here. I think this may be what uh, what you're looking for. Probably more along the lines of questioning than so much of flat statements, but I am reminded <laughs> this is an interesting image, but it suits because I think it, it actually does speak to what Deborah as the judge did. Truthfully, the, um, um, during the time of the absolute isolation in March, when we stopped everything in order to um, fight the um, spread of the, of the COVID-19 virus, while I was at home, I undertook to straighten out my jewelry box. Now, 
that sounds like such a petty little thing to be doing, but it's been years since I had actually gotten in there and looked through. There were lots of things that were, you know, um, handed down to me, and I never wore them, and I never looked at them. But what I came across, and I know that women will relate to this, I came across this massive wad of chains, fine little chains. And they had, through the years, gotten all wrapped up into knots, right? So I took... Um, uh, um, laptop um, holder that had a flat surface and I put this wad of chains there and I sat with a straight pen and a magnifying glass and I began very slowly and very carefully to untangle each of the strands of each one of those tangled um, chains. Now, yeah, it... <laughs> I ran out of patience a number of times, which brings us to one of those things that the judge had to have, one of those things that was important to Deborah, and that was patience. To wait, to work, to unravel, and thus come to some sort of discernment. Now, I'd love to tell you I finished every one of those chains, and but it, it, it no, I didn't. But that, the, the thing that it taught me is sit and separate the strands of whatever it is that you're trying to figure out. And that is in many ways what we as Christians call discernment, that process of discernment. Because over and over again, just like the people of Israel, we make mistakes. You know, the, the chapter begins with, again, the people of Israel had sinned in God's sight. And so, I have to think that some of them at least were going, are we ever going to learn? Are we ever going to be able to change our ways? Well, you know, history tells us that in some ways we were able to change things as we come forward um, through history, but in other ways we're just not able to as much as we try. And that, of course, leads us to God's um, mercy and grace in Christ uh, that saved us from ourselves. But but even so, we still are called upon to judge between good and bad. And that is a process of discernment because very often it isn't a decision that might run something like to kill this person or not kill this person, to exaggerate a little bit. More often, it's how do I discern in the midst of what's going on in the world right now what it means when I stand with the rest of this church and say, we are the light of Christ to the world. How does that discernment work? And you know what? It takes us to what Deborah did, and it takes us to what I worked at with those silly chains from my jewelry box. It takes us to sitting and parting the strands patiently and waiting for the answer to come. Sometimes, like me, you get frustrated and you never get them all undone. But that's where part of being church comes in. Because part of being church is offering to one another this process of discernment. We don't need to be entitled judge. We don't need to have extra special learning to guide people uh, if they come seeking our help. But what we have is this call, which is Christ's call, which is what Christ did. And that is to listen, to listen to what um, someone is saying to us and to try to help that person pull apart the strands, unknot the problem, and begin to see what can and should perhaps be done. Help us to see that, that the differences in shades of gray are real and that we are called not to dismiss them, but to work through them with prayer and with um, spending time with God, listening to God, and through reading the scriptures. And we are called to do that as God's community of faith. Right now, I think in my lifetime, it seems as if this is the 
most important time for us to be able to do that, to sit together and to unravel the knots of what it means to call ourselves the people of God, what it means to say that we are the church and that we are in service to the kingdom of God in the world right now where we are as the church. How do we respond to people whose lives have been devastated by having this terrible virus, being ill from it, and then trying to pick up the pieces and put their lives back together? How do we respond to that at the same time that we are frightened of contracting the virus ourselves? and we are more and more isolated even as we try to come back together. So how do we not just care for one another, but care for the, the needs of the world as they are related to this awful disease and to the pain and the grief and the fear that go along with it? I do not believe that we can simply say, well, there's nothing we can do. I also don't believe that we're called, except for those of you that are, to be medical professionals diagnosing, offering solutions. No, what God calls us to be is this non-anxious presence of Christ in the midst of those who are in crisis. And so there's that call to nurture those uh, who have, have experience of the virus, whether caring for those who have it or those who have had it, but also there's turmoil. There's turmoil and violence um, between the peoples. And, in, and when we read scripture, what we find is that Christ is the reconciling um, presence and, and that and that God comes to, or in Christ, comes to call and to reconcile and to help us see God in the faces of others, whether those faces are like ours or not. And I believe God calls us to seek out actively ways to reach people who are being, um, who are being marginalized people who haven't got a place to sleep or who don't have enough food, yes, absolutely, but people who are denied basic human rights in other ways as well. As the church, we are called to minister in whatever way we are able. And I don't believe that we can any more say about the struggle for the human, basic human rights of all of, uh, of the people in the world. I don't believe we can say about that, well, there's nothing I can do any more than we can say it about COVID-19. We cannot say that because that is not who we are. That is not what we are called to be. We are called to be that, as I said, that presence, Christ's presence, moving among those who seem to have lost hope, those who grieve and those who are hurt and those who are angry and those who are suffering and those who are in pain, whether it's physical or emotional pain. We, by virtue of who we are called to be, we must discern with others how to take apart the strands and how to find our way through and how to unknot the problem with patience and with love and with understanding and with wisdom, all of which are ours because God has given them to us in Christ. And every bit of what I'm saying is validated in the scriptures, in the Old and in the New Testament, and most particularly in the life of Christ. Now, to be what I'm talking about is difficult and we will fail over and over and over again. And yet, this same Old Testament and the New Testament tells us over and over and over again that God says, all right, this is another mess you've gotten yourself into. Let's untangle it and bring you back to what I created you to be. And then that's when we look to Christ to find out what it is.
um, that we were created to be. It's not easy and it's scary and it requires taking a risk. It requires being able to talk to one another with patience and with a will to understand, to listen with the heart of God and not to say, well, I know what the right answer is and I, right now, folks, I'm talking to me because I pretty much always know what the right answer is and I don't understand why the world doesn't listen. But the truth is, we're called to listen without offering the kind of judgment that we associate with condemnation, to listen and to help and support the, uh, the solutions that are required. Patience is not a virtue I have very much of. Wisdom is not something that I have very much of. Courage, no, not so much at all. I like things to be just calm and right where they're supposed to be, I think, in my mind. But in good conscience, in good conscience, I have to say, that is not how we're supposed to live. That is not what God is calling us to do. God is calling us to have patience to listen and to have wisdom to look for God to speak wisdom to us as we find our way through these things. Um, to have courage, not be frightened. And Jesus says it over and over. Angels from God say it. Don't be afraid. I'm right here. Parents have comforted their children numerous times with those same words or very similar ones. Don't cry. It's all right. I'm right here. Well, that's what God says to us. God said it through Deborah. God says it through us. Don't be afraid. I'm right here. God gives us what we need to act. Deborah was a very brave woman, and she spent a lot of time listening in order to offer an opportunity for discernment to those who needed to work through, untie, the knots that come with normal life. As God's people, as Spring Valley Presbyterian Church, we too are called to sit with one another and with the world, with patience, with a listening heart, with courage, and asking God for the wisdom to help guide us through everything that is going on around us and in our own personal lives. I pray that we are able to do that. Let's have a prayer together. Gracious and loving God, you have told us in your Son that you give us everything that we need to be the people you created us to be. And yet, since the very beginning, we have failed to live up to the image of being created as your people. We pray, Lord, for courage and for wisdom. We pray for patience. We pray for an open heart. We pray that we might be willing to take the risks necessary for um, to serve your kingdom and to serve it well. For in serving your kingdom, we will be called out to reach out to others, even in frightening situations to reach out with Christ's peace and love, with words of forgiveness and words of welcome. And so, Lord, give us the certain knowledge that that is what you call us to do. And give us more of what you have given us so that we know we have what we need to live as your people in this time, in this place. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for being with me today. I look forward to our time together in about a week.